This is the story of Piedmont Airlines Flight 22. Now, this video will be titled something along the lines of, did the NTSB cover up the cause of this plane crash? Now, keep in mind, we're talking about the NTSB from 1967. In fact, this was the first major case for the newly formed NTSB. In this video, we will go over the report as put out by the NTSB, and then we will cover the allegations leveled against the NTSB. Then you can make the call as to whether or not there is a government cover-up at play here. On the 19th of July, 1967, a Piedmont Airlines Boeing 727 was flying from Asheville Regional Airport, North Carolina, to Ronaco Airport in Virginia. The 727 had 74 passengers and 5 crew members on board, for a total of 79 people on board. At the same time, a private Cessna 310 with two passengers and one pilot was flying into Asheville from Charlotte, North Carolina. On the day of the accident, it was a hazy day with low clouds. This was made even more challenging by the fact that the airport did not have access to airport surveillance radar. So, the controllers could not see where the planes were in space. Instead, they had to rely on the pilots to give them their position, and then the controllers could vector the planes accordingly. The pilot of the Cessna was asked to maintain 7,000 feet, and he was clear to the Asheville VOR. The pilot of the Cessna was expecting a smooth ILS approach into Asheville. Nothing at the time suggested that this flight would be anything overly challenging. Minutes later, the plane was approaching Asheville, and the controller cleared the Cessna to the Asheville radio beacon. As the Cessna grew closer to the airport, Piedmont Flight 22 was taking off from runway 16 at Asheville. The 727 had been asked by the controllers to maintain runway heading until they reached 5,000 feet in altitude. This was because of the Cessna. The controllers wanted the 727 on a southeasterly heading until the Cessna was over the VOR. But as the 727 was on its takeoff roll, the controllers got the transmission from the Cessna that they were waiting for. Two and Sierra just passed over the VOR. We're headed for the, uh, uh, for, uh, Asheville now. The controller acknowledged two and sugar, Roger, by the VOR, descend and maintain 6,000. With the Cessna out of the way, the 727 could now spread its wings and climb. The controller immediately got on the radio with them and told them, climb unrestricted to the VOR, report passing over the VOR. The controller now cleared the Cessna to land on runway 16. The Cessna replied with Roger. From the tower, the controllers could make out the 727 in a climbing left-hand turn as it turned from a southerly heading to a southeasterly one. Then, out of nowhere, the Cessna appeared to the left of the 727. The Cessna was in level flight, but the pilot of the Cessna made a last-ditch attempt to avoid hitting the 727 by pulling up at the last second. But it was not meant to be. The nose of the Cessna impacted the forward left section of the 727. The jet continued on its path for a bit, but it could not maintain that momentum, and in a few seconds, it started to nose over into a dive, a dive that it would not recover from. None of the 79 people on board the 727 survived, nor did the three people on the Cessna. The wreckage of both planes were scattered in an area that was about a mile long and half a mile wide. The intense fragmentation of the planes was a clear indication that both planes started breaking apart while they were still in the air. In fact, the Cessna was so broken up that the only part that they could easily identify as being from the Cessna was the left-hand engine, and that was embedded in the lower section of the forward fuselage of the Boeing 727. The paint smears on the 727 made it clear that the Cessna impacted on the left lower nose section of the 727, and the left wing of the Cessna sliced through the 727 like a knife through hot butter. Neither plane had no chance of getting back down in one piece. Now, they just needed to figure out how such a thing could happen. How could two planes collide into each other? The first order of business was to see if C and Avoid could have saved the two planes. The investigators needed to know what the pilots of both planes were able to see in the moments before they merged. From the information that they had, like the ground track of the 727 and the rate of descent of the Cessna, they were able to come up with a pretty accurate picture of how the planes came together in the skies over Ashwell. The investigators then went to the FAA's National Aviation Facilities Aviation Experimental Center to simulate what each pilot would have been able to see as they were going into the merge. Based on their data, 
35 seconds before the crash, the pilots of the 727 would definitely have been able to see the Cessna. But there was a catch. They would only be able to see the Cessna if they were looking directly at it. But that's unlikely as the 727 was taking off and the pilots would have been looking forward. They would have no reason to look off to the left from where the Cessna was coming in. If the view from the 727 cockpit were completely unobstructed, then the pilots of the 727 would have been able to pick up the Cessna 10 seconds before the collision. But here's the thing though, the pilots did not have an unobstructed view of the Cessna, nor did the Cessna have one of the 727. You see, as both planes got closer, they were intermittently obscured by the windshield posts in the cockpit, thus further reducing the amount of time the pilots had to detect and avoid each other. Given the speeds that they were traveling at and the cloud cover, it would have been very hard for each pilot to see the other and take evasive action. In a mid-air collision, there's always at least one plane that's not where it's supposed to be. So, which is that plane in this accident? Looking at the location of the collision and the wreckage site, the investigators found out that the Cessna was not where it was supposed to be. The controller had cleared the Cessna to go from the Asheville VOR to the Asheville radio beacon. The pilot of the Cessna had strayed away from that clearance. What's interesting is that the pilot of the Cessna did not expect to be in IFR conditions. This flight was supposed to be VFR or visual flight rules. But when the plane was taxiing out, the weather took a turn for the worse and an IFR flight plan or instrument flight rules was filed. So we don't know how proficient the pilot of the Cessna was at flying IFR into Asheville. So he may have mistakenly flown towards the outer marker or the middle marker near the runway thinking that it was the Asheville beacon that he was supposed to fly towards. Theory number two is that he may have mistakenly flown towards the Broad River radio beacon instead of the Asheville radio beacon as he had been instructed. Theory number three is that he may have just given up on flying the IFR flight plan and tried to fly visually through the clouds. For whatever reason, the Cessna strayed away and it went right towards the 727. The wreckage of the Cessna showed that one of the radios was tuned to the ILS localizer at Asheville, the other one was tuned to the Asheville VOR, and the last one was tuned to the Broad River radio beacon. This made sense if the pilot was following the charts for the ILS approach, because the primary approach fix for the ILS approach was the Broad River radio beacon. Let me know why you think the Cessna pilot deviated away from its planned flight path in the comments below. This is where another big mistake was made by the pilot of the Cessna. From the way his radios were set up, we know that he was expecting an ILS approach down to the runway. This made sense as planes in front of him were given ILS approaches. So he was expecting one for himself as well. But the controller had other plans for him and sent him towards the Asheville radio beacon. Note that no ILS approach at Asheville used the Asheville radio beacon. The controller probably would have later told the Cessna that he was cleared for an ADF-2 approach. But since the pilot of the Cessna had not heard that he was cleared for the ADF-2 approach yet, he just went with his assumption that he was cleared to the Broad River radio beacon and flew towards it, putting his plane right in the path of the 727. Another thing that might have played a part in the crash was the transmission made by the controller. The controller said, 312 Sugar cleared over the VOR to Broad River, a uh, correction, make that Asheville radio beacon, over the VOR to the Asheville radio beacon, maintain 7,000, report passing the VOR, end quote. That tiny mistake probably solidified the misunderstanding that he was cleared for the ILS approach in the Cessna pilot's mind, and so he flew towards the Broad River VOR. Now, all of this explains the crash, right? The Cessna pilot strayed into airspace that he was not cleared to. End of story. But no, there were some people that felt like this wasn't the whole story with respect to Flight 22. Paul Houle, a military traffic accident investigator who spent years investigating the accident, had some issues with the final report of the crash. Here are three issues that he had with the final report. One. According to Hull, the pilot of the Cessna had reported his heading to ATC, which would have allowed ATC to realize that something was off. 2. In the final report, an important transmission is punctuated by a 5-second pause, but a copy of the transcript obtained by Hull from the Bureau of Standards 
shows no such gap. He further alleges that there was a small fire in the cockpit ashtray of the 727, further distracting the pilots in the cockpit. And lastly, the brother of the lead investigator of the crash was the vice president of Piedmont Airlines. Now that sounds like a conflict of interest, if anything. The NTSB is an independent entity right now, but back in the day, the FAA had a lot of sway over the agency. The NTSB in 2006 acknowledged Paul's concerns and promised to look into the incident again. And a review by the NTSB in 2007, nearly 40 years after the crash of Flight 22, found that Paul's claims were unsubstantiated. What do you think though? Do you think that the NTSB was trying to cover up something here? Or was there a secret FAA cover-up? Or is this much ado about nothing? Let me know your thoughts in the comments below. If you want to watch another mini air crash investigation video, then how about the story of Eastern Airlines Flight 935? It's the story of how three pilots landed a crippled L-1011. You can find the link on your screen right now. Thank you for watching this episode of Mini Air Crash Investigation. If you like the videos that I make, do consider liking and subscribing. It will really help the channel grow. I will catch you guys next time. Stay safe.